Hello, I'm Lindsay Johnson, Fiscal Sponsorship and Communications Manager at Southeast Uplift. Thank you for joining us today. This is our sixth session in the seven-part House of Development webinar series presented by and in partnership with Cogio. This session is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. You are welcome to have your camera on or off, whatever is most comfortable for you. We have enabled captions. If you have any additional access needs, feel free to post those in the chat. We do ask that you remain muted during the presentation and save questions for the end. We have reserved time for a brief Q&A. And our final session will be next Wednesday, August 30th from 4 to 5 p.m. That will be focused on data management. And now I'm going to hand over the mic to our presenter, Chelsea, to introduce herself. Excellent, thank you, Lindsay. All right, so as Lindsay mentioned, I'm Chelsea and I'm Director of Client Services with Kogio. So for a little context um, background, um, Kogio is a consulting agency uh, for the 501c3 sector. And what we do is we specialize in providing advice and support services uh, to help really accelerate the development and fundraising growth uh, for nonprofit organizations. So our focus lies primarily with the small to medium nonprofit uh, space, as we found that that can uh, is really where we have the most impact and can uh, really make the greatest difference. And our goal is really to catalyze organizational growth and um, really jumpstart their growth for um, organizations that are a little on the smaller side, have grand uh, missions and visions, but just need a little bit of an extra boost, really. So we have clients spanning across the United States and collectively have about uh, 40 years or more of uh, fundraising experience. And throughout our journey as consultants, we have raised um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, 501c3s, again, spanning across the various sectors, um, various states, um, a few international. So uh, lots of experience and hopefully we'll be able to give you all a little bit of extra education uh, to really help uh, support your growth as well. So with that, let's dive into the content of our presentation for the day. So today's webinar uh, to Lindsay's point is the sixth session in our seven part series of the House of Development. Uh, right now, this, just, this slide gives us a little bit of an overview of where we've been, where we're headed. Our last um, session is gonna be on uh, data management. And today we're gonna be focusing on planned gifts. So this slide you'll see is our House of Development, which you may recognize if you've joined or listened uh, to our past webinars. But as a reminder, to give you a little bit of an overview before we dive into it. House of Development is a tool created by Kojio to conceptualize the successful building blocks of a successful 501c3 and explain why development is so crucial in achieving your organizational um, goals. And the house is really intended to be looked at from the bottom up. So starting with the walkway here, you'll see that really composes uh, marketing and communication. So things like PR, websites, uh, social media, e-newsletters, and annual reports. And as you enter the house, you'll see the first floor is annual and membership giving in the first room. Second room is events. And up on the second floor uh, is really what we, what we term non-retail. So this is restricted funding typically, as opposed to floor one, which is uh, typically unrestricted retail type giving. Up on the second floor, we have corporations and foundations, major gifts at the heart of the house, and last uh, room in the second floor is planned gifts. All right, so now, now on to some goals and context uh, for today's webinar. First, we'll be gaining an understanding of what planned gift um, and planned giving program programs are and how to evaluate uh, effective ROI, return on investment. Second, we'll be developing an awareness of planned giving within the context of moves management, which is a concept that we discussed in our major gifts session. And lastly, is an understanding of how technology and data management practices are implemented in a planned giving program. All right. So now what is a planned gift and planned giving program? Let's start with a little bit of terminology here. So I have a simple definition. A planned gift is a contribution that is negotiated in the present and distributed at a future date. So really, essentially, it's a deferred gift. 
So the majority of plans or deferred gifts are bequests. Um, so that means leaving a certain portion of um, your will or all of your will or assets to a 501c3. Um, and generally it's either a specific amount, for instance, 10,000, 5,000, or a percentage amount. Um, so a certain percentage of the total assets of the time at the time of death would be then distrib distributed to the 501c3. And uh, also our definition of plan giving or a legacy program is a 501c3 organization's means of cultivating and stewarding strong relationships with plan gift prospects and donors for the end of relationship uh, with the 501c3. So essentially it's a maturity plan along the life uh, of the donor cycle. Right, now that we have a little bit of an understanding of what plan giving and plan gifts are, let's talk a little bit about what uh, types of vehicles constitute plan gifts. And to preface, I won't be going too in depth into each, um, each of these, uh, but I do want to give you a high level overview of what is, um, you know, the most common that we've seen to give you a little bit of understanding of what's possible. So in general, plan gifts are non-cash vehicles that can be valued uh, or valuable to certain donor classes. So um, this is going to be based on their financial and estate planning position, what, um, what venue they end up choosing. choosing. So first type is trusts, and there's really three types. First is the charitable remainder unit trust, which has a variable rate. The charitable remainder um, annuity trust is the second type, which is fixed and negotiated. So these are when an investor, uh, for instance, makes a donation of a certain amount, and typically that's around at least 100,000. And then the donor will then uh, get an interest percentage throughout their lifetime. And then at which time the 501c3 will obtain the remainder of the corpus, uh, whatever that amount is whatever is left at the time of death. And the third type of trust is the charitable lead trust or CLT is um, actually the opposite. So it, this is when a donor uh, for a number of years names the 501c3 as the beneficiary and typically is over the course of about 20 years. Um, and then at the end of those specified number of years, the funds are transferred to the named heir of the CLT. Uh, so this can be an issue for some organizations as a caveat. Um, they might not understand the risk of the limited time coming in year to year through the CLT, then you can really put yourself at financial um, risk at the time of maturity. So you need to make sure that you are using the funds that are coming in through the CLT in a conscious effort to diversify your funding streams. So um, just a word of warning not to rely on funds from a CLT because eventually those will end and you want to just keep diversifying, make sure that you um, uh, maintain your financial health of the organization. So the second main type of vehicle uh, for plan gifts is life insurance and retirement policies. So this is a really easy way. It's just designating a life insurance or retirement policy to a 501c3. The third vehicle is securities or stock. Uh, so this can be really attractive for certain types of donor classes who have um, uh, stocks. So they're investors in the stock market, um, often generationally. So they have really built uh, wealth through stocks. Um, so if they have um, stocks that they want to donate, the donor will decide um, to use them as a means of tra transaction. Uh, so they can make the transaction through a broker and benefit uh, from a couple of tax advantages. First is a full deduction of the full market value at the sale of the securities. And second is uh, the ability to bypass capital gains. And the fourth vehicle here is annuities. So the most well-known type is charitable gift annuities. And um, I'll be diving into a case study around this type in a bit um, and how one organization really leveraged uh, the charitable gift annuity type. So we'll dive into that in a little more detail in a bit here. The fifth, time, or the fifth type is a pooled income fund. So this is similar to a char charitable gift annuity, except that in this case, it's the number of individuals who are pooling funds into a particular fund. And this be behaves pretty similarly to a mutual fund uh, for a little context. So on an individual level, these are generally um, smaller gifts than a charitable gift annuity, but they can be similar in size to an annuity um, given the aggregation of, um, you know, pulling the funds. 
And finally, the last main type of vehicle is real estate. So this can also be beneficial to the donor um, and of course the benefiting agency um, because real estate, as we all know, I believe, uh, like stocks and securities can appreciate over time. And one thing or potential risk to note here um, is just the need to do an environmental assessment to avoid um, or at least be aware of any contaminated land. So whenever a land donation may be coming into your organization, you'll wanna make sure that um, you do an environmental impact review. So it's really just an assessment of what may be needed to get the property up to code. Um, so just making sure that you don't just accept it blindly and um, end up with land that you're gonna have to spend a lot in uh, rejuvenating. All right, so now on to our next slide. What are some goals for a planned giving program? First is to accomplish specific fundraising aims. Um, so here is an important statistic uh, that I have here in the slide, which is that 8% of longtime donors will consider a, a bequest. So I'm gonna talk about this stat uh, a bit more as it relates to wills and bequests in a few slide, slides, but for now, just keeping that in mind, um, how impactful that can be. Second goal is to build an established base of funding for the future. So these are transactions that are going to mature 10, 20, 30 years from now, and it's uh, really needs long-term planning mentality. So the person in charge of creating a planned giving program uh, may not see the gifts come in during their, their time at the organization or your agency, uh, but you need to recognize the importance of having a program and, and launching it. So that can be a challenge. I know for some organizations here, really in the here and now focusing on, you know, not that far out, but um, it's really critical to, to start long-term planning and, and launch the program as soon as you can. And third goal is to build closer connections with donors um, uh, between the donor and the 501c3. So if a donor has named you as a beneficiary in the real, their will, it really means they truly believe in your agency and want to be involved. So it's just another level um, of really integration, the integrating the donor with your agency. All right, now let's talk more explicitly about some key facets of plan giving and um, what makes them so important. First, uh, incremental diversified long-term revenue streams. So for instance, uh, at Stanford University, about 25% of the development budget is derived from wills, bequests, and trusts which is significant. So this is the case uh, for many or other organizations um, that have been marketing plan giving for years. Um, and it's a really strong check for establishing a plan giving program as soon as possible. So it can be, take time to really build up your legacy society, your legacy program, plan giving program, whatever you choose to call it. Um, but it can, uh, you'll really see the returns um, once you establish it. Second, it's uh, effective uh, affinity capture mechanism toward maturity of the donor journey. So in other words, who are you marketing to? Typically, uh, you'll be marketing to people in their late 30s, 40s. So this is when the donor is most likely to be thinking about how they'll leave their legacy if they have assets. Um, so you won't necessarily be marketing to 20-year-olds, um, for instance. So you want to make sure that you are um, marketing and focusing and tailoring your messaging to uh, the donor group that's gonna be most likely to implement a planned uh, gift. Third, because you may not have marketed um, your planned giving program, it's often untapped um, donation gifts that you can really receive. So there's this huge slew of potential funding that you just haven't really reached out to, tapped into yet. And fourth, along with major gifts, Generally, planned gifts are the biggest contrib contributions that 501c3 can um, obtain. So for instance, um, an organization that I'm going to talk about in a little bit um, with a budget of several million annually, um, uh, they're called um, Dead Dogs for the Blind. They have received a nearly 200 million bequest about eight years ago. This was a hugely transformational gift, of course, and really allowed them to develop their technology. Uh, namely, they created an app for people who are blind or have limited vision uh, to really plug them into uh, where they are at any given time in the city. Uh, they're also, for instance, implementing this technology at bus routes and 
subway systems around the country as well as universities in California and Oregon. Um, and it's also being implemented internationally, uh, for instance, in India. So um, just a case, a little mini case study of how important uh, plan giving can be. And when it comes in, it can be incredibly uh, impactful. All right. And to the side here, you'll see a little call out box with a few additional demographic statistics that are helpful for um, some extra context. So today, uh, boomers are the main driver with Gen X following closely. So many individuals born between the years of um, 1946 and 1962. Um, so if you're not sure of the age of your membership and donors, you can utilize things like SurveyMonkey or Google Forms to gather this type of information, specifically their birth dates, and make sure that you track this information in your CRM, your customer relation management system. So that could be Salesforce or um, little green lights, um, boomerang, whatever system you're using, spreadsheets, even if you're a smaller organization and um, don't have the capacity to implement a larger scale platform yet. Wherever you keep track of it, make sure that you are keeping track of your donor base and their ages. So you need to really think in terms of multi-generation marketing. Again, boomers and Gen X are about 25% of income um, nonprofit developments. And um, so if you do this really consistently, you'll see revenue coming in from this program long-term from these age groups. And uh, I will note also universities and hospitals really lead the way here. And um, they're a great template to follow uh, that we're now seeing other sectors and types of ag agencies starting to get on the bandwagon and implement plan giving programs, which is fantastic. All right, so next slide here is another one you may be familiar with if you've watched our past webinars, uh, but it provides a breakdown of different types of con contributions by sources uh, in 2023. As you can see, this breakdown shows that 67% of donations come from individuals, 18% comes from foundations, 4% from businesses, corporations, and over 9% comes from bequests. So bottom line here is the importance of bequests. They can really deliver a significant amount of development dollars. And you're like, once your legacy program has matured um, and uh, really been implemented, can be hugely uh, important to your organization and its um, fundraising security. All right. So let's dive in now to best practices in planned giving programs. And before I actually start on the bullets that I have listed here, um, I do want to note that you don't, this is one particular aspect of fundraising that you don't want to outsource to volunteers. We found that it can really um, uh, take time to develop the program and its functionality. So it's, it's difficult to justify a volunteer managing this since they're not paid and it requires a lot of marketing. So best practices uh, in light of that, um, the role of the board, so you want to make sure that you are approaching your current and past board members immediately once you launch a legacy program to be the first plan gift uh, donors or prospects. And present and past board members are really your best lead generators because of their status as past leaders of your agency and uh, can really be the first members of the Legacy Society. You'll also want to um, make sure that um, well, I will actually preface this uh, bullet by saying I'm using Legacy Society right now as a general term to describe donors who um, have or are planning to leave a bequest or planned gift, but you can really name it anything that you want. So um, you want to make sure that you name your Legacy Society um, something that makes sense for your, your organization. Uh, for instance, Stanford University was founded because the governor wanted to honor his son who had passed away from a fever, um, Leland Stanford Jr., and they developed the um, legacy, legacy Society in his name. Um, others we've seen are founders of an organization or someone who was um, hugely impactful at the agency. And if you don't have a logical individual or founder to name the Legacy, legacy Society after, uh, where that branding makes sense, um, you can just use a general Legacy Society, your organization, Legacy Society. So it's a nice neutral term. But bottom line here is really just making sure that you are 
selecting a name that makes sense. Okay. Now for some marketing tactics. First is segmenting by age, as I mentioned um, before. So a 20 year old isn't gonna be likely to be thinking about um, this and estate planning, um, end of life plans. So really 45, around 45, maybe 30s is the ideal threshold to start um, marketing to. You'll also wanna cultivate and uh, educate prospective donors through marketing. So again, marketing, you'll hear that throughout these slides is really key for this um, program. You wanna make sure that you're messaging correctly. Any external facing documents can have a call out box, for instance. Um, so anything like your newsletters, make sure that you have a little um, blurb maybe at the very end at the very bottom to let people know that um, you know you have a plan giving program and how they can find out more. Um, and you also wanna make sure that you're reminding people about it uh, cons consistently. You also need dedicated communication, so intelligent marketing, integrated media, which I'll talk about in a few slides, and um, enabling websites, so having a website support your messaging, which again, I'll talk about in a few slides coming up. Next bullet here is follow-up. Once you've launched the Legacy Society, anyone you've sent the message out to, um, you'll need to also do some follow-up with them directly. Stewardship. Uh, once they've committed a bequest or another trust, um, they've you know become a member of the society. Essentially, you need to make sure that you develop a moves management protocol for them. So you'll want to be communicating with them once every three months, um, and this can be um, really just a general organizational update to keep them engaged and avoid giving them space to change their minds, which can happen if you aren't effectively uh, continuously cultivating your donor. So just make sure that you keep in touch with them. And last piece here is an annual luncheon or event, which can be really effective because many of these individuals who make a um, bequest are retired. So you'll wanna host an annual luncheon for them uh, and treat them really as insiders and investors um, because they're interested, they're committed to your organization, but you wanna make sure that you um, really reflect that interest and continue that engagement with them. Um, and so a small, it doesn't even need to be set anything too major, but having a nice um, yearly event for them to get together and talk and feel appreciated can be huge. All right. So now I wanna move into a case study to really pull all this together in a real life example. And this is Guide Dogs for the Blind. So this is a San Francisco-based organization. And for a little more context, Guide Dogs for the Blind is a really incredible um, nonprofit organization that are helping, uh, that is helping people uh, who are blind or visually impaired uh, lead really fulfilling lives by providing them with um, specially trained guide dogs. So these dogs are really trusted companions, of course, as we all know, um, can really help with uh, help people in gaining their independence and um, confidence. So thanks to Tom Horton, their director of uh, uh, gift planning, they've become the leader in charitable gift annuities. Um, so in 2019, for instance, um, what I really wanna cover right now today, uh, if you were 75 years old and were uh, to invest $100,000 in guide dogs, you would be um, in the first year be drawing down 8.3, so about 8,300. So the returns on corpus grow over time. So the next year it might be 8,500 and so on. So if the entity who made the invest, investment lives a long life, the agency is gonna do really, really well. Um, so essentially what you're looking at here is, um, you know, charitable gifts, annuities, um, the longer the person lives, the better <laughs> for multiple reasons, of course. And um, yeah, Guide Dogs for the Blind has really done this uh, with expert level. Um, they are leaders because they have such a strong bequest program. They market consistently and um, have a lot of internal expertise, which is critical. And another reason sometimes um, having uh, just a pure volunteer group leading the program isn't ideal because sometimes they come and go. You'll want someone on hand who is really committed to the program and can implement it consistently. All right, so now on to a 
um, what I'm calling another case study, but it's really just taking a look at the majority of 501c3s um, in, general, in generality. So essentially any other specific case study uh, is going to be similar to guide, dog for the blind, guide dogs for the blind and maybe just varying in levels of extensiveness. So I really want to take a little time to focus on best practices, best practices for because um, it's going to be crossover for all our most organizations. So first, what's the reality for most nonprofits? Likely, they don't have the intellectual property um, to do a lot of what we discussed. They just lack the knowledge of the options that, that are available, um, don't think to market a plan giving program. They also might have limited resources, and um, that is pretty common, as I'm sure we're all aware, uh, 501c3s um, have that struggle. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can automate it and different tools you can use, but um, you'll really want to have at least one person on hand to help you with marketing and make sure that you are uh, consistently um, educating people about the program. So what needs to change for um, this reality and to really help implement a strong plan giving program? First is board commitments. Uh, so for instance, the chair of the board really has to say that we need to do this and the executive director or development um, director of development or marketing director director really needs to understand um, the importance of it and devote you know an hour to two hours a week. So you'll need also a dedicated resource. And in line with that, I've mentioned that a key piece of a plan giving program is marketing, but what's the cycle for that? Well, it's, it's marketing out essentially, um, education, uh, marketing more, getting the transaction and then stewarding that transaction. So marketing goes to the marketing team, of course, then it'll transition over to the executive director or director of development um, to really close the deal and steward it. Your initial focus on marketing requests as well. So this is where the biggest bang for the buck essentially is since the, it's the most common vehicle, the quests. And once you have the program established, you can really focus on other vehicles. But to start with, we typically recommend focusing on the request elements. So in contrast, for instance, trusts, um, the conversation occurs with the donor's um, investor advisor. So the advisor provides some different investment options, some with a charitable component. Then if the donor selects the charitable comp component, the advisor will ask, you know, do you have a favorite 501c3 that you have affinity for? And this is all happening without your knowledge, uh, which isn't unusual. Usually this is happening, happening which is um, which is the donor uh, initiating it. Uh, for instance, the one bequest um, from another organization we've worked with, Lighthouse for the Blind, came in from an individual they knew nothing about. They found out um, later down the line about him, but uh, initially he just reached out on his own and decided to make this massive bequest. You'll also want um, external resource for other vehicles. So again, bequests are easier to bring in. Um, it's essentially just marketing and a written piece of paper for the closing. Other vehicles are a little more creative. So when you start more heavily marketing those additional options, we recommend that you team up with advisors like Schwab to really help you understand the options and um, you know what to advise your potential donors. Another idea is to bring in board members who might have expertise in estate planning and investments. So again, that speaks um, to lack of intellectual property that I mentioned earlier. So as you build your board, trying to think about um, diversifying the people involved who have maybe some experience in um, plan giving estate planning. And last is CRM tracking. So again, you'll wanna make sure that you're tracking your donors, their birth dates, incoming pledges, um, make sure that you're stewarding. So really utilizing your CRM for a lot of the elements that we've just discussed. All right. So, and you'll see here, I have a link to an outside website that has a really nice guide as well. Uh, we found a really, it's a really helpful resource for just outlining the different steps of creating a legacy society or plan giving program. Um, briefly, I'll just touch on each of them, but feel free to follow this link, take a deeper dive. Um, this will be shared um, also um, through Southeast um, Uplift. So step one, first, you wanna make sure to research. So again, determining who, um, your age range ranges are, what your donor base is, making sure that you're finding out who the 
um, the boomers are, who the Gen X are. Steps two and three are writing and publishing. So again, marketing, making sure you're educating your membership about the plan giving program. Step four is launching the program. So uh, in the article that I've linked, they discuss the board chair, who really needs to take the lead in terms of communicating with the board. Step five is recognizing. So you wanna make sure that you're providing recognition to individuals who do make a bequest or a planned gift. And last step, step six, is including the plan giving um, on everything, newsletters, social media, making sure you're really um, you know, providing a lot of, um, you know, blasts and reminders about the plan giving program. All right. And uh, I know we've been talking about marketing a lot. So let's um, spend a slide or two talking about marketing funnel, um, funnel tactics. All right. So I will say preface this, um, even though this slide is laid out in a horizontal line, just for ease of describing each stage, um, I want to say that this is really a nonlinear process, meaning that you can engage your donor at any stage. But let's talk about each one in a linear fashion, just as a textbook example. The first stage here is attract. So first is attracting donors and members uh, you already have in order to convert them into fulfilling a planned gift. So in this first stage, you may have members who are not aware of your legacy society. Um, or plan or plan gifts in general. They might just not realize that's an option for them. So you have to really communicate and um, build awareness at this stage. Second stage is convert. So let's say you've attracted members into the legacy society through education and marketing. Now you have to convert them by engaging them in a uh, means to close them into endowing um, you with a will or a bequest. Last stage, uh, third stage, I mean, is closing it. So they've transacted. Uh, you want to make sure that you recognize their transaction and uh, log that in your CRM. And last stage is what we call delight. So this is about recognizing your legacy society donors and utilizing the relationship with them to um, provide incentives uh, for other members to join, uh, which then, again, spits you back to the beginning of the funnel. All right, so let's talk a little bit about technology and tools that you can use at each cycle. So first, awareness. Um, social media platforms like X, formerly Twitter, um, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, you can use sites like Canva for free um, graphic creation for each of those platforms. Uh, you'll also want to utilize your website to support you in this process. Uh, you might be using Squareface, Squarespace, excuse me, uh, Wix, WordPress, uh, really any service that you're using. You want to make sure that you're uh, maximizing the capacity to really support in your marketing program. Um, consideration, you'll want to use, again, website. You'll want to have a landing page um, and, and make sure that you're tracking it also in your CRM. I did also provide a link here to a sample of one of our current clients, Ecologic. They have a really fantastic planning page that helps guide people through a couple of the different um, options for planned gifts. Um, I will say your landing page, it's great if you have some detail around the different options that are available to them, but you'll also want to make sure that you have a, a note that they should be talking to their financial advisor. Um, email you want to utilize for marketing. Um, uh, so marketing emails are great through site, through platforms like MailChimp. Um, sales emails you can send through your CRM or um, Google, Hotmail, whatever system you're using. So sales emails are typically one-on-one. -on -one. Marketing emails are kind of mass appeals. And then at the decision stage, you'll want to make sure that you have a CRM set up. Airtable is great for also some additional tracking and um, you know making sure that you are um, housing everything in one place. Um, alternatively, just using Google Sheets, um, that's definitely an option and really just want to uh, reiterate here, making sure that you are being consistent in your data collection and making sure that you are tracking it somewhere central. Um, you also want to have um, finance and reporting set up through thing, sites like or platforms like QuickBooks or Blackbaud. And uh, another one here, infographics, um, where you can 
um, highlight some of your um, demographics and um, how funds were spent to really support in the plan giving program. So you can use things like Fend Gauge or Picto Chart. All right. Okay. And with that, um, a few key takeaway, takeaways, excuse me, takeaways for the plan giving program. Uh, first is resource commitments. And um, it is, you know, as I mentioned, an hour or two per week that you'll want to commit to, which isn't too, too much since it's um, essentially a marketing scheme, but you'll want to make sure that you have someone on hand to devote the time needed to it. Um, second key takeaway is marketing. So again, huge aspect of a plan giving program is um, marketing. So you need to understand how to saturate all of your your materials that are being sent out to your donors with the um, education about the plan giving program. Uh, also make sure that you have a named contact for people to reach out to regarding the Legacy Society. So um, anything, anytime you mention the plan giving program, make sure that people can reach out for more information. So you don't just end it there and they're not sure how to find out more. Um, you'll wanna make sure that you name the Legacy Society, again, something that makes sense. Um, or keep it more neutral, just Legacy Society works fine as well, but making sure that you're choosing something that, again, makes sense to your organization and is on brand. Next here is third-party legitima leg legitimization, excuse me. <laughs> um, so you want to have current individuals who are joined, um, who joined the Legacy Society so you can market it. And this can be really important. So for instance, let's say someone joins, You'll first thank them, of course, but second, you'll want to ask them if they, you can publish, uh, publicize their gift. And if they're not comfortable with the use of their name, you can do it anonymously. Important thing is just to show um, for future Legacy Society donors um, that you already have a, a group of donors. So another reason that reaching out to the board first is fantastic because of their closeness to the, uh, your agency. There are great ones to start with uh, for initial members of the society. Uh, next up here is stewardship practices. Again, make sure that you have a robust stewardship practice. So that inc includes quarterly moves, um, and that's emails as well as the annual events. And if you want to find out a little bit more about stewardship and quarterly moves, next session we'll be covering that in more detail. And uh, we did discuss it also in our um, major gifts um, session. And uh, last key takeaway here is the annual event for Legacy Society members. So again, this can be a, a simple lunch for the members. Um, the for, for a suggested structure, the executive director and board members would attend along with all the Legacy Society members. Let's say, you know, if it is a lunch, you know, around 1145, you do a meet and greet. 1215, you'd want to sit for lunch. Uh, the executive director would get up and make some remarks about the state of the agency. Um, you'd have some eye candy, so photos on a presentation um, while the ED is talking. Um, and then you'll want to leave a takeaway in terms of what they can do. Um, so, you know, maybe uh, that'll be making a, you know, smaller donation or just marketing um, plan giving, reaching out to their friends and family, which is a great way to uh, really continue to um, network. All right. So with that, uh, I want to open this up to Q&A and um, yeah, hear from everyone who may have uh, questions. And feel free to chime in in the chat or um, yeah, um, unmute and ask directly. Okay. And um, let's see. I'm going to take a look here. I do have a couple of um, questions that we get asked consistently. So I just want to put that on our radar, just uh, make sure that I'm covering all our bases. Um, so one question that we get asked um, is um, our pr prospective donors, uh, mostly in the younger age range, which I know I covered, but sometimes it helps just to reiterate a little bit. Um, so again, 40 plus is the target. So in this case, you wouldn't want to launch necessarily at this stage, but you can start preparing for it um, as your donors age up. 
So it's fine if um, you're marketing maybe to a slightly younger age range, then they would actually start planning for their future, but putting it on their radar is absolutely fine. All right, so I think that's it from me. And if anyone yeah. has any questions, yeah, they can reach out. So I'll pass it over to Lindsay. Great, well, thank you so much, Chelsea. And thank you to those who joined us. We'll get this posted online shortly and I'll send the link out to everyone who registered. And then we hope to see you all next Wednesday, August 30th at 4 p.m. for our final session on data management. Have a wonderful evening.